thank you for visiting Gilcrease Museum to see the three documents on display that make up our exhibition, Enslavement to Emancipation, Toward a More Perfect Union. I'm Mark Doff, Curator of History for Gilcrease. I'm very pleased to be joined today by Tulsa attorney, author, and historian Hannibal Johnson, who will share his thoughts on the three documents in the exhibition and help place them in their contemporary context. Welcome, Hannibal, and thank you for your participation. Hannibal will discuss how the documents presented in Enslavement to Emancipation Toward a More Perfect Union continue to impact and influence our lives in the 21st century and ways we as Americans can move closer to the more perfect union promised to all of us. But first, I want to provide a brief description of the documents that you can see and learn more about in the exhibition. First is the 1520 letter from Diego Columbus to King Charles V of Spain. In his letter, Columbus, the Governor General of Spain's American Empire, asked for a license to begin the importation of Africans into the Western Hemisphere to replace the forced labor of enslaved Indians. Second is the museum's certified handwritten copy of the Declaration of Independence. The Declaration not only put the world on notice that the American colonies were separating from Great Britain and were now a free and independent nation, but also put forth the idea that all people are created equal. And then we have the authorized copy of the Emancipation Proclamation. This copy of the Emancipation was signed by President Abraham Lincoln in 1864. The proclamation signaled the beginning of the end of slavery in the United States. And who among us doesn't want to believe that we are one nation united by the ideal of liberty and justice for all as we pledge in our allegiance? But equality, liberty, and justice for whom? For too many Americans, the promise of full freedom and equality, like that promised in the Declaration and Emancipation, continues to be more aspirational than a lived reality. As the events of the past year have so profoundly demonstrated, our nation continues to be challenged with the legacy of slavery and the resulting inequality that still is institutionalized reality of American life. From its very creation, the United States has been trapped in a paradox of inequality and unequal justice, caught between the inspirational ideals of our founding and the challenges of making those ideals a reality for all Americans. And with that introduction, Hannibal, I want to ask you to reflect on how the Tulsa Race Massacre is directly connected to the introduction of African slavery in the Americans 500 years ago, the denial of full equality for all Americans in our Declaration of 1776, and the fact that the Emancipation Proclamation was only the beginning of the beginning of the end of slavery, and how the legacy of slavery continues to bedevil our nation today. You know, one of the things that's really interesting about history is the through line, that history is not in fact past as part of our present. So when we talk about slavery, we're talking about what people would call the original sin, uh, but the aspect of that original sin that still resonates with us today is, I would say, white supremacy. So we talk about systemic structural institutional racism, yeah, that's, that's really important, but the guiding philosophy behind all this stuff is white supremacy. And so that is why we have gross disparities in very, pretty much every indicia of social well-being in the United States. That is why we continue to see uh, these incidents involving police officers and, and young black men primarily. Um, that is why we see controversy surrounding the centennial of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, which shouldn't be controversial. It's our history, we have to own that history, and we have to work on atoning for that history. Um, part of our problem historically has been our unwillingness to tackle hard history, to acknowledge that we have these horrific things in our past that are part of who we are today. And like a wound, unless these things are addressed and dressed, they only fester. So there are many things that we can learn from the mistakes of the past, but we have to first confront them yes. before we can learn from them. Yes, and we've got 501 years of history since the introduction of, of slavery into the Americas. 
156 or so years since the end of the Civil War that should have, at least in our opinion, I think, uh, accelerated this movement path to this full equality. Well, based on this legacy of slavery, Hannibal, how can we as individuals, as Tulsans, take action to move us forward, move us toward that more perfect union that I think all Americans would like to see? One of the simple things that I encourage people to do is just acknowledge their own agency, their own, their own capacity to, to be a change agent. And the late tennis player, humanitarian Arthur Ashe said, start where you are, use what you have, do what you can. So in terms of recognizing and living through your own agency, one of the first things that you can do is introspection get in touch with, with who you really are. Um, surround yourself with people who can really reflect back who you are being in the world. There are a lot of tools online that can get you in touch with your explicit and implicit biases. Use those tools. The other thing that you can do that's very simple is understand that we are represented at various levels um, by individuals who are supposed to be acting in our best interest, in our communal best interest. So we're, we're represented by school board members. We are represented by people in city councils. We are represented by people in the state legislature. We are represented by people in Congress. We are represented by President of the United States. So it, it's really incumbent upon all of us to be politically aware and astute and to help the people who represent us understand what our interests really are. So if we want to, for example, change the curriculum in Tulsa so that the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre and the whole history of the Greenwood community is better reflected in that curriculum, then we can, take, we can call our school board member. We can contact our representatives at the state legislature at the federal level and make sure that they understand that this should be on their radar because it's on our radar. That's agency. Yes, and I think having those internal monologues with ourselves first to understand our own implicit biases, but once we have worked through those to communicate with our representatives, as you said, they represent us, it's not the other way around, and if they're taking actions that don't comport to the, the future that we want, then we need to Absolutely. make changes. Hannibal, you mentioned the Tulsa Race Massacre of 1921. We've just acknowledged, confronted, commemorated the 100th anniversary of that tragedy. And I'm reminded of a quote by Richard Hofstadter, a historian, who said that once in each generation, the American people experience a crisis of real and troubling severity. And I believe with the onset of the global pandemic, and the murder of George Floyd, that we are in the midst of such a crisis. And with that thought in mind, how can the nation turn the passions of the moment, a movement or a moment not unlike the civil rights movements and protests of the 1950s and 60s, into transformational policies that will truly lead the nation toward that more perfect union with true justice and equality for all Americans? It's a very big question. Big question. You mentioned the pandemic, you mentioned the George Floyd murder. I would add the January 6th insurrection as, as one of these colossal events that really make this moment special. And you, on TV, through journalists and on, online, you hear the word re reckoning used all the time. This is a reckoning, this is a moment of reckoning. It, it's, it's used as, as a noun. So I would have us turn that into a verb, because what really matters is what we do about it. Exactly. Not the moment itself, but what we do about it. And what we do about it, I think, really again involves being engaged, being aware. And at a broader level, we have to look at some of the things in our history and think about what it takes to move us farther along the road to rec racial reconciliation. I would argue, and have argued, that it's really, again, I love threes. So acknowledgement, apology, and atonement are three things that we need to do. With respect to what happened here in Tulsa in 1921, in terms of the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre, 
with respect to slavery, with respect to many of these colossal events that, that have happened. Acknowledgement means simply owning our history, understanding what our history is, warts and all, and being willing enough and bold enough to incorporate that history, all of it, into curricular materials so that successive generations know the history. Apology is about both literal apologies, but also helping people understand the imperative of compassion and empathy for people who have suffered historical trauma, racial and otherwise. And atonement is really synonymous with something that people talk about fairly often, which is reparations is a word normally used. Reparations means to make amends or to repair damage. So how is it that we make amends or repair damage? We can do that at the individual level because there are people who are di directly uh, harmed by certain events and they can, they can produce empirical proof that they've been harmed. Uh, they often argue for caste reparations to those individuals. In Tulsa, it would be the survivors and descendants from related to the 1921 Tulsa Race Massacre. That's one form of reparation. I, I'd say that's, that's one stick in the bundle of reparations. But there are communal reparations that are, I believe, equally important. Things like changing curricular materials so that the knowledge base and the awareness is improved. Mm -hmm. Investments in, com in the community, targeted investments, for example, in the black community to spur economic development. Um, targeted investments in the actual physical space in which the disaster occurred such that it becomes fertile field for economic prowess and entrepreneurship. Uh, that it begins to resemble the Black Wall Street of yesteryear. So there are many things that, that we can do, but it begins with acknowledgement and proceeds through apology and atonement. Well, thank you. That's a, a, a really nice um, way of taking either us as an individual, a community, or nationally through this process. Again, Hannibal, thank you for sharing your insights as an admitted optimist myself, I want to end our discussions on a truly aspirational note and quote Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who said, we shall overcome because the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Dr. King was and is correct. Let's commit to doing all we can to keep bending the arc of the moral universe toward the more perfect union with equality and justice, a lived reality for all Americans. Thank you, and thanks again, Hannibal.